Hello, my name is Michael Olson. I'm the sleep apnea surgeon in Rochester, Minnesota, the Mayo Clinic. And today we're going to show you uh, insertion of a hypoglossal nerve stimulator for the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea through a two incision approach. The first step of procedure is to mark out our incisions. Uh, the first incision is a small submandibular incision, which is approximately two centimeters in length. Um, I found this incision uh, can be quite limited to obtain access to the hypoglossal nerve. I'll feel the mandibular notch and then uh, mark out the incision just anterior to where I feel the submandibular gland is, approximately a finger breadth below the mandibular border. Next, we mark out the incision on the chest, which is typically four centimeters in length and slightly lateral to the sternum, overlying the rib space on the anterior chest. This generally is approximately three finger breaths below the collarbone or the clavicle. The next place are uh, electrodes in the tongue. The red electrode goes to the lateral tongue, which is placed very superficially to uh, identify the hyoglossus and styloglossus muscles. And the blue lead goes to the genioglossus muscle, which is just uh, in the floor of the mouth uh, at the apex of the mandible. Uh, incisions are injected with local anesthetic. 1% um, lidocaine with epinephrine is my typical. The next, uh, and which is a very important step, is the proper sterilization of the patient as we want to avoid infection at all costs. Uh, we'll typically scrub the patient with a betadine scrub and then lightly paint uh, with betadine after the scrub. Uh, an important part is to not blot the paint and to let it dry on its own before we move on to draping. Uh, what I'll s typically do is place um, uh, blue uh, towels around the incision, uh, as you can see here. Uh, I also would point out that initially I would use a uh, uh, bite block to open the mouth so we can see the tongue protrusion. I've gone away from this as I feel it does push the mandible down, limiting the dissection of the hypoglossal nerve. After the blue drapes are down, we'll place the clear drape over the patient's uh, uh, jawline, just superior to the incision, so that we can see the tongue protrude as we stimulate it. And then we're going to follow that with the IO band, uh, which uh, is done by the aid of an assistant. We'll start uh, towards the face and have them pull the IO band inferiorly and then uh, compress the IO band onto the skin. Again, sterility is extremely important in this operation uh, as to avoid any chance of infection, which is uh, uh, obviously a big disaster for these patients. So we do everything we possibly can to stay as sterile as possible. Again, you can see the larger incision marked out, which we do not use. We only limit it to our two centimeter incision. The incision goes through the skin and then through the platysma. We're very careful not to cheat in our incision. We wanna keep this small for the patient. Uh, once we get through the platysma, we will dissect down uh, with our landmarks being the hyoid bone. And then we identify the tendon of the digastric muscle. That dissection is typically pretty straightforward, especially if you're able to palpate the hyoid bone, uh, which typically leads us right to the muscle. I'm sorry, right to the tendon. Once we have the tendon isolated, we place a, a right angle clamp underneath the tendon and secure two blue vessel loops uh, to the tendon to help with retraction one more anteriorly and one more posteriorly. Our goal is to not disarticulate the tendon from the hyoid bone, but to just make two small tunnels in an aid to retract inferiorly with the blue vessel loops. Once we have the digastric tendon retracted inferiorly, we're gonna go ahead and identify the lateral edge of the mylohyoid muscle. And once we see that, we're gonna get right underneath that lateral edge and retract anteriorly, which is gonna present us with the hypoglossal nerve Next, we'll bring the microscope into the field. I really do feel that microscopic assistance in this procedure is key um, to identifying those pesky branches uh, that can lead to some poor outcomes. So I like the microscope here. What we've done is we've uh, identified the hypoglossal nerve and we start using a variety of instruments to um, uncover uh, the uh, nerve from its covering fascia. I would say about 70% of the time we identify and have to deal with a Ranian vein. 
uh, and that's pretty s uh, straightforward by uh, ligating uh, the vein. Here it's just slightly inferior. Now what we do is we like to identify the hypoglossal nerve branches and you can see the branch on the left of the screen is heading superiorly and that's the um, hyoglossus and stylogossus branches and the branch heading anteriorly or more superiorly in the screen is the branch that we want to stimulate from the genioglossus or for the genioglossus muscle. Now right there I was dissecting uh, a tunnel. Um, again, uh, you can see the exclusion branches and the inclusion branches there and we're trying to identify and separate a tunnel. Here you can also see a small branch to the geniohyoid uh, muscle which we like to uh, also include in the stimulation cuff. So again, we're identifying the branches to make sure that we have the adequate nerve bundles. And, and for this patient, we're starting to see some signals on the backside of uh, our uh, genioglossus nerve bundle that we want to separate out. Uh, that branch occurs in approximately 20 to 25% of patients. And it's very key that we identify that and dissect that free before placing our stimulation cuff. So now we can see that teeny little branch is outside of the main uh, uh, nerve branch to the genioglossus and we're going to next um, uh, dissect around it so that we can place the stimulation cuff uh, around the main branch to the genioglossus muscle. So we've stimulated the main genioglossus inclusion branch and the small branch that we'd like to uh, have excluded. We've dissected that free. Now we're placing our McCabe retracting dissecting device from an inferior to superior direction to get under our branch for stimulation and to create a pocket for the stimulation lead to wrap around uh, the nerve. This is a tricky part of the operation. We use a Jacobson clamp on the um, flexible uh, cuff of the stimulation lead and with our McCabe we reach underneath the nerve to grab onto that uh, cuff and then gently as possible um, uh, bring that cuff around the nerve. There is a uh, looser and a more stiffer branch of the cuff that the stiffer part right here needs to be of course around the nerve and it takes some doing uh, sometimes to get this around but eventually here you can see that we're able to accomplish getting that cuff to surround the inclusion branches that we've identified with our stimulation. Now once the cuff is around the nerve we irrigate the nerve to get rid of any blood clots or debris that's fallen between the stimulation leads and the nerve. And now we're going to go ahead and secure the anchoring point of the stimulation lead to the tendon of the digastric muscle. These are two 3 silk sutures which are tied again to the tendon and then we place the anchoring point of the lead to the sutures. I like to wrap the lead in a wet salt or wet Raytec to prevent uh, accidental removal of the lead and to protect it from infection. And then we'll place it near the incision while we move on to the next portion of the operation. So the next part of the operation is placement of the implant pulse generator and the respiratory lead. So we dissect through the skin and we get down to the fascia of the pectoralis major muscle, which we've identified here. And now we're going to go ahead and make a small pocket to accept the um, implant pulse generator uh, above the pectoralis major fascia. Of course, we like to make this pocket uh, not too big and certainly not too small, and uh, that prevents issues surrounding movement of the implants and seromas. Uh, so making that just right, typically about one or two finger breaths in size and approximately two or three centimeters inferior to the incision is adequate. Now we're going to move on to placement of the respiratory lead. We spread in the direction of the pectoralis major muscle fibers, uh, overlying a rib space, and uh, gently separating the muscles. We don't use cautery or sharply divide the muscles in these cases. Now, once we have the muscles fibers spread and separated, we identify the um, uh, intercostal muscles or where, where we're going to place the uh, lead itself. We have the internal and external intercostals. Uh, the internal intercostals 
uh, will be seen more medially on the chest, and the external intercostals will come into play more laterally. And you can see the, the direction of the fascial fiber change, and that's how we determine the, the uh, space at which we're going to place the, um, the respiratory sensing lead. An anchoring suture is placed on the fibers of the internal intercostals and to secure the lead to the chest wall before we place the lead. And then we're going to make a small pocket uh, between the muscle fibers. And then again with the Jacobson, we're going to place the lead into this small pocket between the external and internal intercostals. Of course, we want to use minimal force in this area and follow the pocket that we've made between the external and internal intercostals as to not violate the pleura. Now once the lead is in a good position, we're going to go ahead and secure the lead to the chest wall with our previously placed anchoring suture. And in addition, we're going to place a few more sutures through the tabs uh, to secure the device in place to avoid movement. Now there's an additional anchoring point uh, on the lead itself and we're going to loop that into the uh, wound, into the operative space and secure that fairly close to the previously placed anchoring uh, device with a few additional sutures here through the tabs as you can see here. We just utilize the tabs for suturing and at this point uh, we do not need to use the uh, other methods for um, securing the uh, anchoring device with that second anchor. Now next I, I like to put a single 3-0 monocrow stitch in the uh, muscles to bring them closer together. Next portion of the operation is to pass the uh, stimulation lead underneath the platysma but above the critical structures, uh, particularly critical vascular structures, into the uh, chest incision. So we're using the uh, introducer and with a fairly significant amount of force, we're drawing that introducer into our chest incision. Removing the handle allows us to place the uh, lead or post uh, uh, portion of the lead into this uh, metal tubing and allows us to pass the uh, wire underneath the skin without making additional incisions. Next, uh, and very importantly, we're going to copiously irrigate the incisions with either antibiotic solution or normal saline. I can't stress the importance of this enough. We want to at least irrigate with two liters of saline to hopefully prevent uh, a chance of infection. There are two securing stitches for the implant pulse generator uh, placed superiorly in the wound. Uh, they are both 2-0 silk sutures. They're secured to the pectoralis major fascia. Next, we're going to insert the leads into the implant pulse generator. Drying off the posts are important. We place the wrench into the diaphragm on the implant pulse generator to um, release any air, and then insertion of the lead um, until it can no longer be inserted, followed by ratcheting down the screw to secure the lead in place. Once it's fixed with the screw. We then do a small tug to make sure that there's no wiggle room and also ensure that the lead is in full contact with the post. The stimulation lead is then inserted in a similar manner. The anchoring sutures are then attached to the implant pulse generator. The leads are placed on the back side of the IPG and it is inserted into the pocket. We then go ahead and secure the sutures or uh, tie down the sutures and we're going to go ahead and test for functionality. In the functional or the testing portion of the operation, we're starting at a higher level of stimulation to see that excellent tongue protrusion, and then we're backing off our voltage to ensure that no retrusion of the tongue is noted with stimulation at lower levels. 
If this occurs, uh, we would uh, have to go back and reassess the uh, nerve branches so that we ensure that we don't have a uh, retrusing branch within our stimulation cuff. The final portion of the procedure is a multi-layer closure uh, to ensure that the wound does not open prematurely and to prevent infection. Uh, I typically uh, will do this again in a multi-layered fashion um, with external skin glue on top uh, for that final, final layer of closure. Uh, important uh, things to uh, recognize when it comes to the two incision approach is keeping the submandibular incision at two centimeters or less. I don't feel there's any need to make that incision larger than that. It provides adequate access to the hypoglossal nerve. The uh, identification of the hypoglossal nerve and some of those uh, retrusing branches which can sneak along your main uh, uh, protrusing branches are very important. I think this is best uh, performed with the use of the operative microscope. Importantly, uh, maintaining sterile technique throughout the whole procedure is key to avoid uh, infection. Seeing the patients uh, within the first month to assess for wound healing issues and also uh, keeping an eye on them uh, during their activation and titration phases are particularly important as uh, some patients can have some issues related to titration of the device. Um, but in general, most patients do quite well and uh, certainly um, in regards to the two incision approach, we've seen a lot of benefits moving towards this approach and would uh, certainly recommend uh, that uh, surgeons are using this as their main approach for placement of the device.